in the plane of the rubber, even if it is twisted out of what we would normally call a plane in Newtonian physics. Measurements of distances and times do not directly reveal properties of the thing measured, but relations of the things to the measurer. What observation can tell us about the physical world is therefore more abstract than we have hitherto believed. Geometry, as taught in schools, ceases to exist as a separate science and becomes merged into physics. The measurement of distances is subjective and depends on the way in which the observer is moving. The Michelson-Morley experiment is thus, in a sense, the starting point for the whole theory of relativity. Rigid bodies, which we need for measurement, are only rigid for certain observers. For others, they will be constantly changing all their dimensions. It is only our obstinately earthbound imagination that makes us suppose that a geometry separate from physics is possible. Formerly, the coordinates measured in physics were supposed to be carefully measured distances. Now we realize that this care at the start is later thrown away. It is at the later stage that care is required. Our coordinates now are hardly more than a systematic way of cataloguing events, but mathematics provides, in the method of tensors, such an immensely powerful technique that we can use coordinates assigned in such an apparently careless way just as effectively as if we had applied the whole apparatus of minutely accurate measurement in arriving at them. Indeed, there is an advantage in being haphazard at the start. We avoid making surreptitious physical assumptions by supposing that our coordinates have some particular physical significance. But we don't try to proceed in ignorance of all observed physical phenomena. We do know certain things. We know that the old Newtonian physics is very nearly accurate when our coordinates have been chosen in a certain way. We know that the special theory of relativity is still more nearly accurate for suitable coordinates. From such facts we can infer certain things about our new coordinates, three postulates. Our first postulate is that, if two events are close together, but not necessarily otherwise, there is an interval between them which can be calculated from the differences between their coordinates. That is to say, we take the squares and products of the differences of coordinates, we multiply them by suitable amounts, which in general will vary from place to place, and we add the results together. The sum obtained is the square of the interval. We do not assume in advance that we know the amounts by which the squares and products must be multiplied, that is going to be discovered by observing physical phenomena. But we do know, because mathematics shows it to be so, that within any small region of space-time, we can choose the coordinates so that the interval has almost exactly the special form which we found in the special theory of relativity. It is not necessary for the application of the special theory to a limited region that there should be no gravitation in that region. It is enough if the intensity of gravitation is practically the same throughout the region. This enables us to apply the special theory within any small region. How small it will have to be depends upon the neighbourhood. On the surface of the Earth, it would have to be small enough for the curvature of the Earth to be negligible. In the spaces between the planets, it need only be small enough for the attraction of the Sun and the planets to be sensibly constant throughout the region. In the spaces between the stars, it might be enormous say, half the distance from one star to the next, without introducing measurable inaccuracies. Thus, at a great distance from gravitating matter, we can so choose our coordinates as to obtain very nearly a Euclidean space. This is really only another way of saying that the special theory of relativity applies. In the neighbourhood of matter, although we can still make our space very nearly Euclidean in a very small region, we cannot do so throughout any region within which gravitation varies sensibly. At least if we do, we shall have to abandon the second postulate, that bodies moving under gravitational forces only move on geodesics. We saw that a geodesic on a surface is the shortest line that can be drawn on the surface from one point to another. When we come to space-time, 
The mathematics is the same, but the verbal explanations have to be rather different. In the general theory of relativity, it is only neighbouring events that have a definite interval, independently of the route by which we travel from one to the other. The interval between distant events depends upon the route pursued, and has to be calculated by dividing the route into a number of little bits and adding up the intervals for the various little bits. If the interval is space-like, a body cannot travel from one event to the other. Therefore, when we are considering the way bodies move, we are confined to time-like intervals. The interval between neighbouring events, when it is time-like, will appear as the time between them for observers who travel from the one event to the other. And so the whole interval between the two events will be judged by people who travel from one to the other to be what their clocks show to be the time that they have taken on the journey. For some routes, this will be longer, for others, shorter. The more slowly they travel, the longer they will think they have been on the journey. This is not a platitude. I am not saying that if you travel from London to Edinburgh, you will take longer if you travel more slowly. I am saying something much more odd. I am saying that if you leave London at 10 a.m. and arrive in Edinburgh at 6.30 p.m., Greenwich time, the more slowly you travel, the longer you will take if the time is judged by your watch. This is a very different statement. From the point of view of a person on the earth, your journey takes eight hours and a half. But if you had been a ray of light travelling round the solar system, starting from London at 10 a.m., reflected from Jupiter to Saturn and so on, until at last you were reflected back to Edinburgh and arrived there at 6.30 p.m., you would judge that the journey had taken you exactly no time at all. And if you had gone by any circuitous route which enabled you to arrive in time by travelling fast, the longer your journey, the less time you would judge that you had taken. The diminution of time would be continual as your speed approached that of light. Now, when a body travels, if it is left to itself, it chooses the route which makes the time between two stages of the journey as long as possible. If it had travelled from one event to another by any other route, the time, as measured by its own clocks, would have been shorter. This is a way of saying that bodies left to themselves do their journeys as slowly as they can. It is a sort of lord of cosmic laziness. Its mathematical expression is that they travel in geodesics, in which the total interval between any two events on the journey is greater than by any alternative route. The fact that it is greater, not less, is due to the fact that the sort of interval we are considering is more analogous to time than to distance. For example, if people could leave the earth and travel about for a time and then return, the time between their departure and return would be less by their clock than by those on the earth. The earth, in its journey round the sun, chooses the route which makes the time of any bit of its course by its clocks longer than the time as judged by clocks which move by a different route. It is important to remember that space-time is not supposed to be Euclidean. As far as the geodesics are concerned, this has the effect that space-time is like a hilly countryside. In the neighbourhood of a piece of matter, there is, as it were, a hill in space-time. This hill grows steeper and steeper as it gets nearer the top, like the neck of a bottle. It ends in a sheer precipice. Now, by the law of cosmic laziness, which we mentioned earlier, a body coming into the neighbourhood of the hill will not attempt to go straight over the top, but will go round. 